Hello and welcome to the Talk Tonight podcast. Today we are joined with Keris and Keris and we are discussing what they mean to you and we're going to be, what do you want to tell our viewers and listeners who we're going to be talking about today? So we are talking about Kasabian. Everyone's favourite, the boys from Leicester. You, you just can't hate them. They're one of the most no. influential indie bands in Britain. So Keris, Kasabian, first question I'm going to ask. Might seem a bit obvious, but what do they mean to you? Okay, so this is going to sound really, really cringy, but they're like everything. Honestly, I think it's. I think this year, obviously, with everything that's gone on, it is really hard to talk to the, talk about them at the moment with people. So I feel like this this podcast is like my way of getting this out and talking about them. But I feel like there's there's this quote from like Alex Turner, and he talks about like how there's always that one band that comes along when you're like. 14, 15, that changes everything. And I feel like that was me with Kasabian. I, I got into them or I sort of became obsessed with them when I was about, must've been about 14, I think, just turned 14, maybe before that. And obviously for crying out loud, it just come out. And I remember buying it as I think it was for Father's Day or something for my dad. And I just remember listening to that in the car with him and just absolutely being so transfixed by this, by this album, because obviously they're like, they're quite a diverse band, you know, they have so many influences. I think the way that Surge produces each album is just, it's just great. You know, I think they've opened up a lot of new doors, like music wise, you know, I've been listening to genres that I wouldn't really listen to, you know, I've become really into like electronic music and sort of like the nineties sort of electronic music since. Well, since that's Surge's style, isn't it really? Because obviously he has that band with Noel Field and, you know, you see Surge. Yeah, Lewis Half Street. A very sort of edgy character. That sort of yeah. would you would you say then that surge is the reason that Kasabian went to sort of like you know when experimenting with electronic music when it came with uh, I think it's like is it forty eight thirteen yeah uh, forty eight thirteen that's a very electronic album I think there's a there's a track on the album I think it's on the deluxe da- album called Gelfling I think that is like one of the most un Kasabian like Kasabian songs I mean yeah it's like really electronic but you wouldn't expect them to create a song like Gelfling. Yeah. And yeah, it, it was, I think it was just a deluxe track. I'm not too sure, but it's on Spotify. It's, it's a really, really good track. Um, no, I remember, I remember when the album came out and I remember buying it on the CD. Um, you wouldn't expect to buy anything on the CD these days. So, uh, well, because obviously electronic music. Um, I mean, music you can buy to get off Spotify, not electronic, literal electronic music that you can go and buy. Um, but I, I, obviously, you know, you had, the, the, the sort of aesthetic of the album really was the intended yeah. to be electric because obviously you had the um you know you just had the color theme you had the way that they uh, played the live uh, the live gigs um yeah with all the different words on the t-shirts you know yeah and uh, obviously they had the countdown clock in the background and it's just how did they go from producing indie rock anthems to being this experimental electronic edgy band yeah i think i think they were like that from the start anyway you know the first album was very electronic based and there were so many different simps and like so many like little different little fillers you know like running no running battle wasn't a running battle was an actual song yeah so like there was orange i think pinch roller was another one there's so many different little interludes that they've done and then obviously 48 13 was another little interlude album and you had like Oh God, like I think Mortis was the name of one of them. There was Levitation, Shiver, I think was one of them as well. And obviously this year, you know, it's been a, it's been a wacky year yeah. with the music. And th- there's one thing, because uh, obviously you're talking about Kasabian, I have to talk about this because this is just curiosity killed the cat. But as you're yeah. a fan, a devoted fan, what did you think about Tom? Oh my God, I'm not, <laughs> I genuinely, because I, I don't really want to go into too much detail because yeah, yeah. obviously it's not my place to talk about it. But like, no. I think when you idolize someone so much, like Tom has been like one of my sort of idols for I don't know how many years now, probably like three. <laughs> and I think the the whole thing with like idolizing someone and like sort of knowing or feeling like you know them, you don't really know them. If you get what I mean, what I'm trying to say. And I think, yeah, I feel like you often see Tom as like this sort of this really, really like happy, bouncy. I mean, obviously he is very hyperactive. You can only, you can tell in interviews, but I just think the fact that he is so broken and that he has been and that he is crippled by his mental health. And I, you know, I'm not going to condone what he's done yeah. because, you know, it is absolutely disgusting, 
but the fact that he kept that in for so long and that his only way to deal with that was through like you know alcohol and then getting that intoxicated and then doing what he did it is disgusting and it is horrible and it's one of those things where I feel like I don't understand why he hadn't been I mean I don't know if they'd given him support we don't really know exactly what's going on behind the scenes but it's wasn't it um I heard something that when they were playing live shows it's like sort of calm him down if you like yeah he he he, yeah he's talked a lot in the past about how he's had anxiety since he was a kid and also I wasn't I'm gonna be perfectly honest I wasn't surprised when I saw the whole thing of him saying that he'd been diagnosed with ADHD I actually thought he'd already been diagnosed with ADHD I'd read places that he had been and I think I think it's just it's it's really difficult to talk about with people because you've got so many people that say oh oh my god you know you just got to cancel him you know cancel him out because Sabian did the right thing you know letting him go but it, it I feel like oh it's just so hard to talk about I don't I feel like I'm trying to say loads of things, but they're not coming out. <laughs> oh, sorry, I, 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 in a comparison, really, um, I remember when, because I, I used to be a massive Smiths fan back in the day. Yeah. Younger. Um, and I remember when Morrissey um, was, it was back 2016, Morrissey was just coming out with these outlandish views. <laughs> and that put me in a difficult position because I idolised Morrissey and I was like, do I support him? Do I continue mm-hmm. listening to Morrissey and the Smiths? I would yeah. just walk them out completely. And that's the case of Tom, because obviously I I wholeheartedly yeah. don't condone what Tom did. And yeah. I just and uh, I do and, think a lot of people are being really, really hard on him for something mm-hmm. that he it as I think I've I've tried to say already that it's like you don't know who they really are, like yeah. behind closed doors. You you only see what you see live and in interviews. And I think you can almost you can almost tell that he is almost at breaking point in a lot of interviews and he is someone that isn't mentally all right you know yeah and he has talked openly there is an interview i think he did back in it must have been 2017 where he was talking with i think it was like some australian journalist and he was saying about how you know how it's affected him and yeah but i feel like the same thing's happening with ian brown now like on twitter all this stuff he's like spouting out about like the whole <laughs> coronavirus anti-vaccine stuff it's like talk about Ian Brown you can't country. trust anyone anymore he see the thing is and uh, Richard Ashcroft like obviously said this uh, he came out and said this with um I think it was a few years back and he said obviously it's not a musician's place to like talk about politics mm. 50-50 with that one because you get people like the pigeon detectives but then you get people like Ian Brown and Come on, come on, Ian. What's going on, Ian? Yeah. I mean, but obviously, I, I agree strongly with, with what you say about Tom because obviously, yes, obviously, what he did was disgusting. Obviously, it was disgusting. Yeah. Most of us. But yeah, then again, this is a man who is hyperactive, who has, he was just bursting with energy, and has also, you know, got a very bleak history of mental health. And, mm. you know, I, people are. I guess I give him a bit of a hard time, but then again, some people would say, obviously, you know, because he's an abuser, he deserves to have a hard time, really. What would you say? What would you say to that then? I, I, I just think, right. So, him and Vicky are still together. There is literally, I'm not even joking. Don't call me a stalk or anything, but her, her Instagram, <laughs> the, the love it. that she has for him still after everything has gone on. I remember seeing when he got signed to new management, I remember seeing a post that she put on of it was a photo of them, them together. And she was saying, oh, my God, I'm so proud of you, blah, 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 like that. And I just think, like, you know, if if she's been able to forgive him and not being able to press charges and not being able to, you know, look at look at it in a negative way. Well, obviously it is negative, but you know what I mean? Like that that kind of thing. I just don't understand why people can't look at it that way and why people can't just move on from it because yeah. I, I think that's what they're trying to do and i think reminding them every day of what on is not 
is not the right thing to do and I do think it is horrible and I mean I had to I had to log out of Twitter for like a week because I, I got loads of messages of people or just people replying to me like oh my god why are you supporting an abuser for or quoting my tweets being like he literally abused his wife why are you defending him like I wasn't defending him I was yeah. just being just and you just let him move on and try to you know get his life back or get well, their life well, back that's the thing with social media isn't it because obviously you know um we do live in a sort of opinionated culture uh just to put it that way because we do everyone has opinions and mm. everyone's very passionate about their opinions i get that but when it comes to twitter especially twitter um well, i was gonna say social media when it comes to social media especially twitter you know some of it's because people do believe that they are just behind the screen and mm-hmm. they can say whatever and you know obviously you, you don't know what's going on the person that you're attacking you don't really know what's going on inside their head and mm-hmm. i'm not obviously just just to set the record straight both of us and well neither of us are condoning what tom did mm-hmm. but you sort of need to look at it look at his character really and sort of assess mm-hmm. that and sort of i just you know, i, I think the way that the band have treated him like we don't i don't know whether because i have i've done a bit of a snoop and i've looked and serge and tom aren't following each other i think the only member of kasabian that is following tom is tim i think who is like their touring guitarist yeah i well i think he is anyway um i saw something of them like two in them two interacting or something and i think i just i think that it's either it's either they're just not talking in real life or it's a publicity thing and that their management is saying you know can you not don't follow each other on social media because you're going to cause havoc between yeah. people because it is a very divided fan base at the moment i was in a group chat literally shortly before it all kicked off mm-hmm. um that group chat no longer exists because it was a very 50 50 split of people being like no no we don't like we don't like what tom's done i mean no one does but yeah. You know, it was very much, there were some people who were still, you know, still like Tom and still, you know, support him and everything. And there's some people that don't. And I think it is, it's broken that band to pieces and it's broken the fans in half. You know, you've got some fans that don't support Tom in any way, shape or form anymore. And you've got some people that just want him, you know, to get his life back and just want to send him loads of support. Well, that, well, that thing there you said there about Serge and uh, Tom, well, that's mainly just, like, it, it is got to be for public image really because mm-hmm. you know if you're because obviously Serge is the backbone of Cassadian and mm-hmm. the beating heart well was the beating heart of it and you know it's sort of you know someone's probably turned around to Serge and said look you've got to unfollow him because you need to sort of distance the band as far away as possible from him because of what he's done and obviously mm-hmm. I can imagine Serge Serge comes across as a sort of very progressive person who you know mm-hmm. condones actions like that and he, he takes stuff like well like everyone should take Actions like that very seriously, incidents like this, like that very seriously. And I think management just turned around and said, Look, this is not going to be good for your image. Just unfollow yeah. them. What would you say? I think, yeah. I think it is just very much like a whole. I mean, I don't want to say it, and I'm not going to say that this is exactly what's going on, but I genuinely just think it's just something that their management has just said because they've dropped him from the management. They've dropped him from, I think, merchandise, like, and royalties and stuff and I just think it's got to be something to do with that like I don't think someone who's got such a close bond like Tom and Serge have I don't think they would they would just completely lose contact with each other but obviously you know Tom was as you could see you could say he was the sort of beaten part of the band really because he was just this burst of energy when he came on stage Mm -hmm. in the music videos he's this burst of energy he's just He's, he's, he was a very energetic person. The way that that was reflected in many of the songs, yeah, uh, in his discography, it, you know, it sort of you can tell that, you know, it's it, he's a very energetic guy, really. Mm-hmm. I I think it is sort of becoming like a almost like a Gallagher situation where it's like, if the band were to go ahead. I don't think it would work. It's like almost like you can't have an oasis without a Liam and you can't have an oasis without a Noel. Like that is the way it is with Tom and Search. They're like the same. It's like a similar format. Yeah. And obviously, you know, I personally think, this is my personal opinion, that in the next year or so, uh, Serge, Kasabian will fuse into Serge's project that he has on the side of Northfield. And that will sort of become his thing, more or less, really, because... 
you know, he talk because obviously, like I said, Tom was the beating heart, Serge was the backbone. But without a beating heart, you can't have a backbone. So Serge is probably just going to invest more time in the project that he had in Northfield and then try and do something like that because you know that is at, at this time, like without Tom, this that sort of suits uh, Serge's style really, doesn't it? Yeah, I don't. I don't think they should go ahead as a free piece. Or some people have said to get a new frontman. I don't want a new frontman. Like it, it's not. I mean, obviously, it's not down to me what they do. But I think what would be best is them to just do their solo projects. So Tom has already started working on his, and Serge obviously has the SLP that he, you know, he could do a follow up. Maybe get. I think Chris actually did play bass on his like tracks and played with him live, and they could get Ian Ardno to do like some session drums on it. Because I just I don't think I just I don't think Sabian's going to work as a free piece. I think if, even if they do, it's not going to be the same. It's just no, absolutely definitely. And I just I obviously I think because because Sabian you know defined the mid nineties really didn't they? Yeah, I see. I just I just love like the whole you know like the the landfill indie or what they call the landfill indie sort of movement. Yeah. I grew up with a lot of the music from that and Kasabian. Like they were a band that I remember hearing because you know I had like a parent who was like massive fan of it. Like my dad, he always had their albums and stuff. But they weren't a band that I ever remember really obsessing over like I did with you know like when I was like three years old. I was absolutely obsessed with the Automatic. Like I absolutely yeah. loved that band and I still love them. In bands like the Ordinary Boys and Razor Light and all that stuff, and I feel like Kasabian are one of the only real like bands from that that era that have really stayed like massive. Like Razor Light, they're still going it going yeah. around, but they're still quite you know they're quite sort of well. Don't they're you, not you know, like because obviously we're in a new decade now, and because uh, one thing one thing that I found like being part like being invested in music as I am. Um, during the latter half of the previous decade, now going into the 2020s, that landfill indie is sort of becoming, you know, it's, it's becoming a thing of the past, really, because you've got bands um, that are becoming more raw, becoming more sort of experimental in the mm -hmm. guitar playing, in the drum playing, becoming more digital, uh, digitalized. And I just think, obviously, Kasabian, they define the landfill area, uh, the landfill area, sorry, but. I, I do think that maybe it is time, in my opinion, for bands like Casarian that to sort of either adapt or they'll die. I think I I I've sort of I've always described Casarian as future rock because they always they always go of the extra mile. I feel like with their music, you know, they are very experimental. They will always try new sounds, and I think I think that is the way forward. You know, with with what Serge has done with the SLP, it is very electronic. It is very much. It's almost like it's almost quite a lot of it is very hip hop influenced, like mm -hmm. even more than Kasabian is. You know, they they I think they're they're kind of like wait, <laughs> I don't even know what I'm saying now. Um I just I think because of what Serge has done with the SLP and how you know he's featured a few people, I think Slow Tie was one of the artists that was featured on one of the tracks, um, Little Sims. I think if Sabin were to go ahead I could see them doing you know like a few features you know like yeah. that you know almost like what gorillas are doing where they'll yeah. they'll have an, an artist come in you know I feel like that they if they were to still go ahead they would probably do like a gorillas or something and go and do like features with people but don't you feel like obviously because you did bring up the idea that the band could bring a new frontman in like wouldn't that be like sort of Queen and Adam Lamb, like an Adam, Adam, Adam Lambert situation where it's sort of like forced in this front man that has no link to whatsoever to the band, there's no history with the band members whatsoever, and you're forcing like just that to sort of keep something alive, really, that is dying? Oh my god, I just I can't imagine Kasabian with another front man though. Like, I know a lot of people probably said that about Queen at first, but yeah. I just can't imagine them without Tom. And I know that, you know, Serge does lead vocals on quite a few songs, you know, You Boat being one of them, which is like one of my absolute favourite Kasabian songs. But it's, it is Tom. Tom is the frontman of Kasabian. You can't not, you can't not have him as the frontman. Well, yeah, because obviously when you think of Kasabian, well, when I think of Kasabian personally, because obviously I'm a huge FIFA fan, um, Obviously, I, 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 I like the from from my life. Kasabian has always been 
a feature. The, the, their music has always been featured in every Who Got Skin on, probably over the last like ten years. And it's sort of it because obviously I, because obviously Kasabian did define the theme soundtrack sort of mm-hmm. playlists. And I just think that obviously because because obviously Tom's um, Tom's vocals is very sort of. You know, he's so distinctive. Com- like there's, I feel like it's almost like he is one of those frontmen that has such a distinctive voice. Like you you hear his voice and you know that is Tom. It's like Liam Liam Gallagher. You know if you hear him, that it's him. Or Alex Turner, or any other sort of like frontman. Have you ever been to a Kasabian gig then? I obviously, I'm a yeah, I've seen them twice now. I saw them on Crying Out Loud tour. So the year that I discovered them, um, I watched them do Reading and Leeds on the telly, and I just was like, I, I need to go and see these live at some point because they're absolutely amazing. Like I've literally only just become like really into them and like listened to a load of their albums. I was like, oh my god, I need to get tickets. So I got tickets to Crying Out Loud tour. Saw them at the O2, probably the best gig that I've ever ever been to. Then I saw them at Fetford Forest, and I honestly, I didn't realise that that would ever be the last time that I'd ever see them. But then I got tickets to go and see them in Leicester, which obviously never went ahead, um, which honestly, when I found out that was cancelled, I was ill on the day that 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 was cancelled. I had a really bad migraine and I remember waking up at like four, going on my phone and that was the first thing I saw and I was just like, like, I couldn't have had a worse day. Well, I, 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 because obviously I can imagine that we all, like people that are watching this and listening to this, we all knew someone or we were someone who had tickets to go and see them. Um, play live, yeah. It was going to be like their Nebworth. I feel like I keep making loads of comparisons to Oasis here, but you know, like, they are it, Oasis, yeah, That's I feel sweet. like it was going to be like their, or because it was their homecoming, it was going to be like their main road, you know, or it was going to be like Arctic Monkeys doing Sheffield or yeah. something, you know, because obviously, when you um, because because the things with Cassidian and Arctic Monkeys, Arctic Monkeys. I would say it's very centred around Alex Turner, but obviously you get to know most of the band members. But why I think you're right in your comparison for, with Kasabian and Oasis is because Oasis, people, it was only centred around the two leading um, mm. members, whereas in Kasabian, that's, that's the same case really because... Yeah. I think I think similar backgrounds as well. You know, they they often talk about being like, you know, from this sort of background where it's quite working class you know and then growing and becoming this this massive band and I feel like though different from Oasis I would say is that they still live in Leicester it's not like Oasis where like the Gallaghers they come from a council estate then as soon as they get loads of money they move down to London and live in these massive houses you know they still you know they still remember where they've come from and they still live you know around Leicester and that and I think I think that's the thing with them. They're so down to earth. You know, they're such a down to earth band. Well, the, the thing is, they live and breathe Leicester. They live yeah. the football club. They, you know, they played a gig. They were supposed to play a gig at the King Power. You know that. Yeah. Oh no, they 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 played the gig at the King Power. It was Victoria Park that wasn't that Victoria was supposed Park. to have gone ahead. But they did. <laughs> they did Victoria Park in 2014 as well. So. Ah, um, but yeah. The King Power. Uh, I do apologise to anyone out there who loves Kasabian uh, like yourself. No, it's fine, honestly. <laughs> that wrong because um, no, it's, it's just it, it's been a long year. Just please go easy on me. It's been a long year. My yeah. Been agile. Please, just please, please go easy on me. It's oh, fine. <laughs> I'm enjoying. Um, but yeah, uh, in a sense, when when they like played the K, uh, the KP, and obviously Oasis, they played Main Road. And obviously, it just sort of has that sort of it, it, it was just yeah. a mirror reflection of yeah. You've also got to remember as well that Kasabian wouldn't exist either if it wasn't for Oasis. You know, they're the reason why you know Serge picks up a guitar, the reason why you know they're together. And I feel like before before then they've talked about it before that Tom was really into hip hop, and I mean so was Serge. You know, Serge was really into like rave music as a kid, and so like that combined with Oasis and like the rock and roll whole thing, that is Kasabian. You know, that was what they were influenced by. Because obviously, because um, it's, it's, it's like a little, it's like a little system, isn't it? Um, a little like succession, a little. Um, I don't know what to describe it. It's like a little lineage system. So obviously, you had the you had the Beatles, you had the Stone Roses, 
and then you had Oasis, and then you got Kasabian in the nineties. Yeah, then... you could also add the Smiths to that as well. Yeah, because yeah. Like, obviously Noel Gallagher picked up a guitar because of Johnny Marr. So, yeah. well, it's it's a shame that the front runner of the Smiths and the front runner of the Stone Roses have mm. led some very controversial lives. So, I mean. I think front men do though. That is just a just just a trait that they have. They've got to be as controversial as possible. I mean, yeah, yeah. I, I, I guess I guess that's the entire. I guess, well, I guess that's the industry's fault, really. Sort of, yeah. the, sort of image that's built up of rock and roll front men. Mm-hmm. It's it's damaging, and obviously some front men can't take it. Some yeah. uh, front men can hack it, and it's just. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know. It, 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 it's just it's just it's it's the pitiful. Uh, in, in the way that the industry is at the moment. Well, I wouldn't say all the industry. I'd probably say like the top 1%. The bottom 99% though is probably the most great. It's, it's the greatest place that you could ever be. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, um, obviously, um, you mentioned earlier about uh, an album that you quite admired. Uh, is there a certain set of uh, Kasabian lyrics that sort of define, like that you'd say define your outlook on life or... Like yeah Kasabian. there is one in particular that is literally my my lyric like and that is live to fight another day from stevie obviously i think stevie isn't one of my favorite kasabian songs but it is one of my favorite songs to hear live i think once you hear stevie live that is like that is it like you are obsessed with kasabian from then on i think that is one of their best songs that they play live um mm-hmm. But I'm not going to, I don't want to talk about it too much because it is like still, it's something that I don't talk about a lot with people. Um, But two years ago, around this time, two years ago, I was literally at the lowest point of my life possible. I just, Sabian was the thing that literally like took me out of that, you know. And even like, you know, when I was really low, it was that one little bit of hope, that bit of, and that, that line, I I want it tattooed on me at some point. Like that is my lyric. That is the one I think it's like probably got to be one of my favorite song lyrics of all time. I love it. There's a few, there's a few other ones that I absolutely love as well. Rock and roll sent us insane from Goodbye Kiss. I love because it just, it just sums up how I feel about music, to be honest. It does make you mad. Well, Obviously, I can imagine a lot of people can relate to what you just said, Keris, like, like myself, because we do have we, uh, the greatest music that, well, in our, like, from our own perspectives, the greatest music that we admire, the greatest music that, like, you know, we flood our playlists with are those songs, are those artists that sort of, you know, help us out uh, of the rubble, really. And obviously, Kasabian, I can imagine, are very, obviously, with the energy that they have and the sort of, you know, talented songwriting that they have and ta- talented guitar playing that they have. I just, I can say one of those, they are a very uplifting band, really. Um, very electrifying. It's one word I always describe Kasabian with, electrifying, because they are. Yeah. I think, I think their, their live performances as well are just one of the most, like, amazing, uplifting things you will ever see. Like, I think, or even when they get, like, the really sad stuff going, like, I remember, I remember hearing Goodbye Kiss Live, which is, like, the saddest song that they've ever done. Like, the, it's one of the most depressing songs that Kasabian have ever come out with. And yet that still, it still makes you happy. Yeah. Like, it just, I think, I just remember when I was at the O2 and LSF went off, just, oh my God, they had confetti oh. going everywhere. They had the decibel meter. It was amazing. And then when we, we came out after the gig had finished, everyone was just literally just screaming, la, 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 la. And it was just like the most amazing feeling. Well, I, I, I can imagine because obviously I've been there um, with most bands uh, that I've admired over the over the years. Um, and when you see them live, I mean, they play an absolute belter that sort of unifies yeah. the crowd. It's the best feeling ever. I've got yeah. to say. Um, but obviously, you've came on a day uh, wrapping your Kasabian merch. You've got a poster behind you. Yeah, I have that in the background. I have the t shirt. I've also got a scarf as well, like a blue like one. I don't know. I bought it off eBay like in lockdown because I was just really, really bored. And I was just like, I, I feel like I need some more Kasabian merchandise. And then around the time that I bought that, that was actually like, I think I must have bought that the day or the day before like they announced that Tom left. So it was like, as soon as I was like, right, I need to buy as much Kasabian merchandise as possible. So it said like, I said it was rare. So I don't know whether they they sold them at the King Power gigs because it's like blue and obviously Leicester mm-hmm. and the whole the blue and everything. Well, so I don't know, but it, it's nice and it's hanging up over there. <laughs> always nice to have a bit of merch, to be fair. Obviously, yeah. you know, when you're in stuff like lockdown, I think, and yeah. stuff happens when you're a Kasabian fan, you've got to lighten the mood a bit. 
buy some bit of merch, spend a bit of money. Why not? So would you say then, like, would you say, um, would you would you say then that you're a fan, or would you say you're a worshipper of Kasabian? Would you say the Kasabian is your right. religion? So I am going to be completely honest here. I I would describe myself. Most people would describe myself as a complete like this is my obsession, but like I. I want to say, yeah, I am a worshipper. I absolutely love them and I adore them and they are literally everything to me and they're always going to be my band. But like recently, and I don't know if it's because of everything that's gone on. I think it is. It's just, I've become so much more distant. I have to be so careful with what I post on the internet yeah. now. Like I have to be so careful. I used to make like these on YouTube, I used to make like these fan edit things of them. What? So I've like this one, which is like learn the alphabet with Kasabian. It's like A is for B is for and it has loads of different things and I've just had to I've had to take all the comments off I've had to like do that unlike and dislike thing like I've had to take that off yeah. and it's just it's really really depressing like I can't express my love for them as much as I you know I used to be able to because of everything that's gone on and having to explain myself it's it, it, it does sort of like portray the sort of polarized more than at the moment in the sort of opinion the one thing i will say though is that people still love john lennon for what he did even though he did loads of things that you know i guess yeah i, I, found, this out. I found this out on the anniversary of his um death but yeah um yeah you can't it's a shame really because you can't really 100 percent enjoy yeah. artists but um Karis, it's been great having you on the podcast today yeah. Okay, it's been good. Yeah, I, I've, I've enjoyed. I mean, I've enjoyed. I've enjoyed uh, it's it's been a pleasure really talking about Kasabian. Yeah. I mean, covering. some of it, some of it, I feel like has been so hard to talk about. Like, I literally feel quite like when I was talking, obviously about like everything. I feel quite choked up because it is quite. It's it's still quite hard to talk about. It is something that I, you know, I will even though I try to put it out of the back of my head every time I listen to them. It is something that I think about all the time. Well today you've came on you've yeah. sort of you've tackled the subject you've yeah. gave your opinions on it you're exp you've expressed it in a very great in a very um impressive way um and obviously you know i i, I it's been a pleasure sort of hearing uh yeah, a it's, been, it's been really really good because i feel like it's just something that i i need to get off my chest and i need to talk about and yeah yeah and you've done that by coming on here today but it's been a pleasure thank you for coming on um, for all of you that for all of you that don't know, um, Keris is a writer uh, for our for our blog, uh, the Talk Night blog. Um, check out her pieces; um, she's got some great pieces out there. Um, but yeah, go and support her writing. You know, yeah, it's thanks. Really in the industry at the moment, but Keris, it's been great having you on, and um, thanks. <laughs>